let's move on to our next fireside chat. And I'd like to welcome for this fireside chat between Deborah and Sandeep Singhal, the co-founder and managing director of Westbridge Capital, Sandeep Singhal. Westbridge is a private equity firm that has invested billions in the most dynamic startups in India. They are an investor in LEED, Physicswala, ADA 247 and others in the edtech sector. Sandeep mentioned that his investment philosophy is to take large and bold positions in companies that deliver impactful solutions for the masses. Please join me in welcoming Sandeep Singhal and Deborah Quazo. Thank you and welcome Sandeep. Um, it is a, uh, an Thanks, honor sir. to get you onto our stage. Um, you don't do this a lot. Uh, you know, when I Googled I'm not, you... I'm not very good at it, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, I Googled you. You're very hard. To, you're, you're very elusive, so I, I'm very appreciative of you being here today. Um, in founding Westbridge, uh, you and your U.S. partner, uh, Samir, who I, I met earlier and many years ago, um, have really built, as many folks in this room know, the, the absolute gold standard of in India investment firms. It's been over 20 years. It's come in different formats, Westbridge, Sequoia, back to Westbridge, um, and, you, and you manage over $5.6 billion in 120 plus companies. Um, your growth aperture is very broad. It's not just ed tech, uh, all across India and Southeast Asia. Uh, but you do have a very tight focus on Indian entrepreneurs. Uh, you've experienced, I think it's fascinating because of your, your trajectory is that you've experienced a whole series over 20 years of revolutions effectively in the Indian um, ecosystem, uh, many ecosystems actually, from Geo to Aadhaar to you name it, um, where we are today. I'd love to just hear kind of your reflections on your core thesis when you and Samir started 20 years ago, how that's evolved and kind of where you sit with that core thesis today. Yeah, no, well, thank, thank you, Deborah, and such a wonderfully organized conference and, you know, on, on, a, on a topic that is critical. Um, I think most starts are somewhat accidental. Um, you know, back in the year 2000, I still remember that I read a news article which said that the FDI in China was 30 billion, and India that year was less than a billion. And um, you know, I was at BCG uh, in those days, and it, it sort of occurred to me that in the next 20 odd years, okay, we may not reach where China is, but we'll still be 10, 15, 20 billion dollars of FDI. And then sort of, you know, who's going to think about the capital allocation issues? And something as simple as that sort of motivated to start thinking in that direction and then you know, connected with Samir and others. Um, and that's how really the start was. And frankly, there wasn't any ambition or there wasn't any, you know, really a looking glass as to, you know, what will come. It's just like, you know, I, I felt like it's going to be interesting to help and work with young entrepreneurs and build something, uh, you know, um, and I'm a little bit, you know, right now, tongue-tied because, you know, those years were very slow years, you know, it was, right. our, our economy was a 0.5 trillion in the year 2000, you know, the full country's economy, and it wasn't sort of, sort of this, this sort of, you know, confidence that we have today that, look, yeah, it's only a matter of time. We had no idea where things will go, but it still seemed like, you know, some of the confidence at that point of time, the only, the only people to look around was people like Nandan Nilekani, who's here, and, you know, you're going to hear, hear him probably later, uh, and, and they were such wonderful role models. Right. It sort of felt great to feel, okay, there's going to be other things like that. And that was really the start. Very, very sort of organic, some one step in some direction, not, not some big ambitions. And as you sit here today, a very different moment, um, looking, you know, you've just surpassed, India's just surpassed China in terms of population. How, how, how are you all thinking about your broad thesis, you know, for the, you're a very long-term thinker as well. So what do you think about the broad thesis for the next decade or so? Yeah, I think if you think about it very simply, you know, I think in the 20 year prior to 2000, India added maybe 0.2 trillion, 
-hmm. of GDP, 0.2. Right. In the last 20 years, India added 2 trillion from 0.2 to 2 trillion. In the next 20, India will add maybe about 6 to 7 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, so whatever happened in the last 20 years is going to happen at three times the size in the next 20 years. Um, that's all you need to know. And then the rest of it is just focus on, you right. know. Finding great exactly. founders. Exactly. It's interesting. I was actually talking to somebody about this yesterday, but um, who was talking generally about the education investing landscape. And, and actually, in my view, West, Westbridge is really, you, don't, you didn't intend it this way, but um, the preeminent education and skills investor in the country. Um, you've ta you were early at, uh, in Tudor Vista, companies like Tudor Vista, where you sort of got your, you, you dabbled and got your uh, feet wet early, um, you know, probably, you know, probably too early, but, uh, but that you have to do that to kind of get, become informed. And now you actually cover what we, what we call the pre-K to gray landscape. You've got, you know, everything from lead school and the K-12 space up through, uh, you know, ADA 247 and the skills space and everything in between with Physics Walla that we, an investment that we share, um, Vedantu, Sunstone, et cetera. So love to hear how education evolved as such a big focus for you all. Um, you know, what's made it attractive as an investment category and kind of what do you see, um, how would you rate its attractiveness today? And that'll come in, I'll lead that into another question I have for you. And, and how do you see things changing for the, for the education and skills sector? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that we tend to do at Westbridge is to sort of think about markets very simply and at some point we just sat down and said, look at any average household and look at what do they spend money on. And there are four or five categories. Uh, education sits sort of pretty high in that. And um, the, you know, ask any average Indian parent, low class, middle class in terms of economics, uh, rich people, everyone places very high value on education. Yep. Uh, and uh, people always overstretch, you know, from whatever they can Indeed. pay. And it's just something that is just ingrained. Uh, and it was clear to us that that what was out there at every level, you know, if a poor person was shelling out X amount of money, the return on education that they were getting, you know, your phrase, I, I love that phrase, uh, is, uh, was poor, you know, was not great. And so was true for middle classes, and so was true for rich people. So everywhere the, the education system was broken, and uh, there was no hope to sort of repair it because, you know, you need the number of teachers or the kind of things that we needed just seemed like not going to happen in short period of time. It's only when the power of internet truly really showed up, uh, it seemed like that the order of that problem will reduce by, you know, from 10 to 1 uh, just because of the digital tools. You know, so you needed X number of teachers, you'll probably need now X number of great teachers. You can, you'll still need those teachers, but you, you can divide them into truly inspirational great teachers and other teachers who help them. Um, um, the sort of richness reach compromise that was just so evident that, you know, if you have good education, it is available only to a few people, yep. will only be broken by, uh, by tech. And, and that's where it started. And then we were, we are bottoms up, uh, you know, investors. We kept looking at companies. There were a bunch of companies that were scaling quite rapidly, but they were all focused on sort of the rich, you know, people like, well, rich is the wrong word, but like people of high economic ah. paying power. While the mass, India is about that mass, and it's, it's there where both the promise is broken the most, and the value of solving that problem to the end customer is just phenomenal. So we decided at some point that we're going to bypass the sort of, you know, yep. people like us, and we're going to focus on, I always say this, that I'm going to focus on my driver's children. And that's, that's sort of what led to everything. And, and when you all did that, I think part of the issue was cons for why the focus has been at the top of the pyramid is concern about monetization in the middle and, and bottom. And how did you all kind of get beyond that issue to get comfortable? Right, um, right. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, and you know, it wasn't very clear at the beginning um, how that will pan out, but then, you know, people come around, you know, Samit and Smita in the audience lead school and, you know, Alak and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ashish and, um, um, you know, all, all of the guys who were, um, you know, they came and showed us that if done rightly, 
the power of internet will basically bring down the cost of delivery quite significantly. And that is what will allow you to, you know, it's a little bit like we didn't have phone service in India 25 years ago. It's only when mobile phone came right. that it became ubiquitous and you know, the cost of delivery became very low. And similar things showed up in education, but basically entrepreneurs showed us that it can be done and we just followed their lead. Are you still as bullish on the thesis today? You, how do you, how do you feel about it? And you know, yeah. I, I, look, I think there's, well, that education is the most important subject in a family in India at all levels. It's only going to strengthen. It's not going to get weakened. That's for sure. So it's something for which an average householder will take loan, will sort of go long on it, and sort of invest in their future generation. Education is obvious. Um, we are probably, in, I don't know, second inning of a 20 inning game. So I think it's just now, yeah, that was now we have to all be thoughtful and careful and see how things change. But it's still very early, is how I would think about it. And we agree. I mean, I think it's been, it's been interesting. It's even some of the conversations I've had with media and things here over the last couple of days is, you know, there's obviously a lot of negative, you know, negativity out there. The market's obviously, you know, the, the, the whatever, the winter, the funding winter that we're in, you all are flush with capital, so you do not, you know, you are in a position where, uh, for the entrepreneurs out there, uh, Westbridge, if you've, got, if you've got a, if you're focused on the middle and bottom of the pyramid, or Westbridge is flush with capital. Um, so you, you believe, I mean, make a comment, I mean, if you could comment just on that, because I think the tone is excessively negative, at least in, in our view, and I'd just be curious for your thoughts on, on yeah. what's happened and, and in the, in the broader economic climate, the capital markets climate, and what that's meant for founders and what that means for the sector, and yeah. et cetera. No, I think, I mean, nothing new. I think all of us know that, you know, the next day after parties, normally sort of, you know, fasting and sort of, you know, uh, in India we call it nimbupani and sort of, you know, recover. So I think there is going to be a period in which all of us have to sort of look at what has happened in the last, right. Uh, three or four years, but there's no doubt that uh, uh, from what has happened in the last two or three years, uh, the lessons will go into building things that are stronger, uh, more capital efficient, more thoughtful, the excessive unreasonable competition will go out, the customer is smarter, the investors are smarter. Uh, so I think next innings will be a, a better game overall. Uh, it's just that everyone has to absorb what has happened in the last few years and and take lessons from him, and then sort of, you know, there's going to be a good party <laughs> soon again. There will be another party. I'm old enough to know there will be another party. This is a <laughs> so. six, sixth party in 22 years, so I can, I can yeah. promise that <laughs> there will be another one. But I think the key is, the key is, well, party is probably a word that uh, sort of presents a different picture. The key is that, uh, let's call a spade a spade. There was a lot of excess in the last two or three years. And uh, as long as one faces the facts, and all of us were in that party, it's not like sort of, you know, some of us were, some of, all of us were there. As long as we uh, take a recognition and make amends and sort of, you know, focus back on the 1.5 billion Indians that sort of, yep. you know, are wanting us to solve their problems, it's going to be back again. I agree completely. And because you are a bottoms up investor, are there sec is there something in the sort of pre K to Gray space at this point that you all are? looking for? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, theoretically we have covered these spaces, but in reality, um, you know, there's, the thing about India is that there's so many micro markets within India. Right. I mean, what, you know, the number of people who live in India is, I don't know, maybe 2x of the US and Europe together or something like yeah. that. So there's so many different income populations, there's so many different, there's so many different flavors. So I think, in the same broad things, K-12, college education, post-college jobs, and skills, there's going to be multiple different things that are being done, and you know, our shop is open every day, we meet new entrepreneurs, and um, I'm sure we'll find many more things to do. And, you're, and you don't, I mean, you're very, you, you, all, you all really invest across B2, you know, all models, right? B2B, B2C, and there's really no, you're, that you're neutral to, to make up, correct? Uh, neutral to? To business model. Right. So, B to B, B to C, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. makes yeah, no yeah. sense. For us, uh, we are we are very neutral. It just has to be something. One of the things that 
you know, I, I don't think Nandan is in the room, but one thing he taught me once, I was asking him, how does he make decisions in his life? And he said, I only do things that are relevant to population. Means they're relevant to every house. So as long as the company that we are working with, this is more me for my personal time, but as long as the company that I'm working with is solving something that's relevant to a large number of individuals, like pretty much every household. Now, whether it is being solved through going into a school or a college and solving it for the end customer or going directly, uh, that doesn't matter. Yeah, those numbers work. If you're selling something to every Indian household, Absolutely. those numbers work. Absolutely. Um, you're not, a, you, you don't, you would never call, I don't think you would ever call yourself an impact fund, but, um, but I know that you care deeply about mission. Um, your education portfolio actually reflects impact from our perspective. You know, we are an impact fund and we at least share two investments and I wish we, we shared a couple more. But um, I loved reading actually about your 2020 commitment to the Chess Academy. And I would just love to uh, get your comment. You, and I also love the fact that you said that you don't really view it as a CSR or anything, investment. You, you view it as a different kind of thing. So I'd love for you just to tell the audience what you all have done in, in backing that uh, chess champion and his, his academy and what you hope for India. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think just, uh, I think impact investing is fabulous. Um, also, there are many places where you can make massive impact in models that are actually commercially not only viable, actually thriving. Right. Particularly because of the digital and internet layer. It sort of agglomerates the small pennies together and it creates great possibilities. On chess, uh, it's just one of those things, you know, uh, one day in some context, I happened to meet Vishnathan Anand, who's, as all of us here know, that he's a five-time world champion. Um, one of the greatest uh, sort of Indians, I would say, um, uh, in many different respects. And I was talking to him and saying, well, look, you know, after you, nothing really happened. Like, there's no other world champion that came from India. And he said, look, the time is about to come, that we have this massive crop of young players who are coming. Now, whether they will become world champions or not, it's not clear. But with, actually, internet, the spread of chess in this country has become so far and wide, and he expects that in the next few years, uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting crop of young, uh, talented uh, guys who come up, who will come up. So, now, I have seen this thing in the U.S. called the spelling bee, and I've always <laughs> wondered, you know, why is Talked it that... Talked about that earlier, yeah. Why is it that, like, eight or nine out of ten kids are from India? Actually, chess is something similar. And in that conversation, it occurred that if we were to organize that world right, and get the right kind of coaches. And now the West Prize Anand Chess Academy has three ex-world champions, including Vishwanathan Anand and two other sort of, you know, all of these guys are from Eastern European countries, Poland, Russia, uh, and so on and so forth. And all the training happens online. And we picked the top eight grandmasters of the country. They were all between the age of 12 to 16. All of them were grandmasters, but they were in top 100. Within one and a half years, four of them are in top 20 senior players in the world. I would bet that 10 years later, out of the top 10 chess players in the world, four are going to be Indians. Wow. And that's sort of reflective of population statistics that at some point of time, and also when it comes to education and sports related to education, it's sort of something that plays to our strength, you know. Exactly. Uh, a physical sport plays lesser to our strength, but a mental sport plays to our strength. So that's really how it started and, you know, it has over-delivered. Uh, most of the credit goes to Anand. We are largely sort of, you know, a force behind him and he's the magician there. I think it's fantastic. I, and I loved your comment in one of the videos I watched that you brought, the, you brought him into your office because you viewed the pattern recognition of chess to have an analog to investing, which... Um, yeah, he was unbelievably... He just, you know, the way he think, thinks about chess and realizes how we think or should be thinking about our, exactly. our business. It made yeah. me run out, want to run out and learn how to play chess, so that'll, that'll be my next, my next project. Um, quick comment for a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience, and, and having now read all of Nandan's various books, and your, Nandan Nilakani, who will be up after lunch, and who is a dear friend of Sandeep's, uh, you know, he's spoken about the impressive, you know, the incredible rise of the Indian digital economy, and, he, and I love his analogy about dominoes falling. And, and one of the key dominoes he points out is the rise of Indian entrepreneurs. Um, you and Samir have seen a wide array of entrepreneurs, not only across Asia, but across America. Um, and I just love, and I, and I have found in our brief you know, spell investing heavily in India, there is just something different about the Indian entrepreneur. And I just love to hear your reflections on what makes 
the DNA so different and so compelling? Yeah, no, I think Indian entrepreneurs are, um, uh, I think entrepreneurship also sort of is naturally suited to Indian temperament. You know, because entrepreneurship is 90% of the time just being at it. It's like, you know, just being at it. And uh, uh, we've had, we are in a country which has sort of, you know, has been starved for resources for a long period of time. And people worked really hard to make their lives happen. And, you know, uh, there wasn't an organized setup. So a, small, a farmer, a small businessman, actually all the skills of running a business are present in pretty much every family in India because people have run those very, very small businesses. And actually to run a small business is really hard. One of our friends, Manish Sabarwal, who's going to be also speaking here, he always says running a five crore business is 10 times as hard as running a yeah. 50 crore business, yeah. you know? So most families in India have somewhere in their DNA mm -hmm. that learning and um, it just naturally suits Indians. And hence, quintessential Indian entrepreneur is actually not someone who's, and this is what we've seen in 22 years of our investing industry, is not someone whose chest is out, who's sort of strutting about the stuff. And you know, like some other geographies, like the US has great entrepreneurs who are like super confident, they've got a way about yeah. themselves. An Indian, uh, there's all kinds, but a, but a typical great Indian entrepreneur, shoulders are down, is gentle to the world, knows how to sort of make the world work with them, and is always looking to sort of avoid conflict and sort of, you know, go about their own way. And that's sort of, if you look at our most successful companies, our entrepreneurs will pass that muster. Um, and finally, I would say most Indian entrepreneurs actually have no use for money. Yeah. I mean... Uh, their lifestyles are same. They, we all come right. from, you know, uh, so even the ones who are really prosperous, and I can see some people in this room, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Pawar is sitting here and so on and so forth. Lots of, lots of really successful people, their lifestyles don't change. You know, they, they are sort of still living the same normal. So for them, entrepreneurship is about, it's just about something that we love doing. Uh, we haven't yet gotten full opportunities in the next 20 years. Um, uh, and this, in the last five years, got distorted for a little bit. It seemed like that an Indian entrepreneur is like the American entrepreneur, but if you go back and see who's succeeding now and who's going to succeed, it's going to be more former in, in my instinct, but of course I could be wrong. Yeah, we, we, the only other observation that we have is that uh, Indian entrepreneurs do not sleep. Do not sleep. <laughs> Do not see. Most of our Zoom calls are at three in the morning in India, and uh, it's, it's uh, really quite remarkable. Nobody sleeps. Last question, or our last sort of minute to go, is you've been a very successful investor really across all categories, public markets, private markets, and, uh, and everything in between. Um, one thing I think the, the education sector could really use is some preeminent public companies. What do you think about the prospects for, and, it, and it appears, you know, for Indian ed tech companies going public and successfully, like the emphasis of the world, um, how do you see that and when do you think that might happen? Yeah, I think um, one thing going around in Indian ecosystem is that that IPO is, or going public, is a solution to ills of the business. You know, like I, I hear a lot of... And that's not true. I, 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 hear, <laughs> I hear a lot of my friends who are, who are sort of, you know, whose business has not found the model, they're not, you know, the economics is not yet right, and, and they'll tell me next year they're going public, and, you know, I, I don't say anything, but I, I know that they're going to double their troubles by doing that. Yep. Uh, so first thing is that all companies must wait patiently to get to a point where their business is more predictable, where their economic model is found, and, you know, they have actually a reasonable amount of healthy profits Largely speaking, of course, if you are a tech-driven company that has got a lot of spend in R&D and there's some magic sort of, you know, J-curve. In India, we have less of those companies. Right. So all ed-tech companies must wait, get to a place where they have healthy, predictable business model and profits, and then go public. Because uh, otherwise, for, for an average public investor to sort of invest in a company that is likely to become profitable. So I think wait for profitability. And my general advice is that until you have like 100 to 200 crores of profit. Now, for some companies that may happen fast, and as you and I know, we, we know mm -hmm. some companies we one, together we, shareholders. We have one of those, yeah. Right? They can, they can go public. But, 
you know, there's no doubt that five, seven, ten years later, you're going to have three or four or five very good uh, education-focused public companies, and you know, it's going to be one of the sectors. Education in India is a consumer business because I just want to add that that uh, unlike many other markets where government plays the majority role in education, in India it's going to be the private sector for multiple different reasons. Government tries its best, but the scale and scope of the problem is such that private sector will solve it quite significantly along with government. And as a result, you will find public companies, uh, 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 you know, as just a consequence. All I'm right. hoping that Anil of Adda and, you know, uh, lead and, you know, all, some of our companies there. But yes. it, uh, the, my only advice would be take your time. There's no hurry, you know, go public when, when you've got lots of profits under your belt. Okay, you all heard it here. So run out and get your uh, Crores profitability going and we'll, we'll, we'll be back with a lot of public companies in five years. So we certainly hope that's the result. Well, thank you so much. Our time is up. We really appreciate your thank joining you. us. Thank you so much, Sandeep and uh, Deborah. And Sandeep, I was surprised that I didn't hear the word Jugaad. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's, that's my favorite word in Hindi. Um, anyway, before we break for lunch, really quick announcements. So if people could just wait until I finish the announcements. The first is that we have a startup showcase. So the stars of tomorrow are going to showcase their companies in the, in the ballroom next door at 12.45. Lunch is available in two places. Please go up to the, the glass house as well as in the outdoor courtyard. So we, we ask you to please split yourselves up. And then the last announcement is that we have uh, Nandan Nilekhani starting exactly at 1.30. I think this, it's going to be standing room only, so please come in earlier to take your seats. Thank you so much.